Good evening and welcome to Forum 360 where we have a global outlook from a local view. I'm your host Leah Love and today I'm so excited to talk about rethinking sexuality and authentic intimacy. Our guest today is Dr. Julie Slattery and she is a psychologist, author, speaker, and I'm gonna assume in your spare time, you're a wife, mother, friend, mentor. Yeah, a few things like <laughs> a that. A few things. So we are so excited to talk to her. So thank you so much for being our guest today. Glad to be with you. All right, so tell me a little bit about how you got into this realm of rethinking sexuality. Um, well, I think I initially was introduced to the idea of talking about sexuality just as a psychologist. You can imagine when people come for help, so many of their issues uh, have aspects of sexuality, broken sexuality, trauma from the past, uh, brokenness in relationships. And so I, I was familiar with working with individuals on that level and then probably about maybe 15, 20 years ago began doing more holistic wellness type work with just women and marriages and families and just general issues. But I would say it was probably about 10 years ago that I feel like God really called me very specifically just to talk about sexuality. And it wasn't something I would have ever signed up for <laughs> because as you can imagine, topics of sexuality are not only very vulnerable, mm -hmm. uh, but also they're very contentious. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. in our day and age, these are some of the topics that people will argue about and disagree on. And I'm a sensitive kind of people pleaser type person. So mm -hmm. some of the issues that we talk about and help people with, um, you know, are difficult ones. But when God asks you to do something, really the only answer is yes. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Willingly or unwillingly, There you right? go. <laughs> uh -huh. Yes. Um, so it, give me the definition of what intimacy is. Mm. Um, I think a lot of times people hear the word, but they don't necessarily understand it fully. Yeah, I think that's a good point because when we use the word intimacy, I think most people in immediately think of sex or mm -hmm. sexuality. We use the word intimacy actually as kind of like a softer way of talking about sex. But sex actually is just one aspect of what intimacy can look like. Intimacy is the part of us that wants to have a deep connection with another person. And so we can be good friends and have an intimate friendship because we're unguarded with each other, we're sharing, we care about one another, we're committed to each other. Uh, I, there's intimacy within family relationships when they're good. Uh, but then there's also intimacy in marriage and romantic relationships that can be emotional intimacy, even spiritual intimacy, and obviously physical or sexual intimacy. So it's really that idea of, I have my defenses down, I trust you enough to show you who I really am, and you do the same. And so it's a deep, deep connection. Of being really vulnerable yes. with somebody. Mm -hmm. mm, I love it. Um, and then can you define sexuality? Yeah, I think, again, <laughs> sexuality is way more than we tend to think of it. When we think about sexuality, we usually think of just the physical aspect of our sexuality, what we're doing with our bodies. But our sexuality is the whole aspect of us that is drawn towards uh, an intimate or romantic relationship. And so when you think about, for example, teenagers, that have that awakening, we're most uh, aware of what's happening to their bodies and the hormones that are being produced. Yeah. But what we also don't recognize is now all of a sudden they're thinking about romantic relationships. They're thinking about being attracted to somebody. And really it's almost their body and mind's way of saying that they weren't meant to do life alone. And so our sexuality encompasses a lot of who we see ourselves as, who we see other people as, the desire that we are to be vulnerable and to be drawn into close relationship, mm -hmm. and then obviously the expression of that through what we do with our bodies. So you mentioned teenagers. What is, um, and I'm sure this is probably really broad, but what is a good time or age to start talking to youth about sexuality and intimacy? Boy, I think that it way goes before teenage years. Okay. And the reason why is because uh, our kids are immersed in a very sexualized culture and it's rapidly becoming more so with the internet and with all the devices kids have. Uh, some people will say that we live in a pornified culture where everywhere you look, even just on advertisements or billboards or music, 
candy commercials. Yes, <laughs> yes, and unfortunately, even the pornography uh, companies are pushing their products on the youngest and most vulnerable. And so we really believe that it's important to start talking about healthy sexuality and, and, and intimacy at really the youngest ages, age appropriately, of course, but two, three, four, or five. And when we talk about sexuality, we're not, again, just talking about our bodies and what our bodies do, but we're talking about what love is, uh, what family is, what marriage is, uh, you know, in a home, maybe my, why mom and dad have their own bedroom and the door is locked, why they go on dates. All these aspects of just even daily life are aspects of understanding sexuality. So I think it starts very young. Mm -hmm. And it, as a parent, you want to get to your child's worldview about sexuality before it gets taken over by what everybody else might be saying, or, or again, what pornography is saying. The research is showing that the vast majority of young adults even today, but of course teenagers and younger, are learning about sex through pornography, which is a very twisted way to learn about something that is meant to be very good. Mm -hmm. And I, I was talking to a group of young girls and just asking them, you know, doing a little research, what is your, your ideals or your notions? What have you been taught? And um, unanimously against the three, they said that, you know, mom said, don't do it. It's yeah. bad. You know, you're only supposed to do it when you get older. And so they kind of have this negative connotation. But on the same sense, instance, they're very curious, you yes. know, they really want to explore, but they're like, I just, I'm lost, I don't know what to do. So what would you say to, you know, maybe some young who have experienced that, but also older women who have taken that same, you know, negative connotation yeah. all the way through? Yeah, I've really learned that all of us in some ways are sexually broken. And one of the ways that we can be sexually broken is how you're describing, it's not just the bad things that we may have experienced, the traumas we experience, those are certainly aspects of sexual brokenness. But it's also thinking about sex itself as something that's dirty or shameful, or thinking about your sexual desires as something that your desire is wrong. Not all of our desires are wrong. You know, think about it as if uh, teenagers never had any sexual desire. It just all went away. Mm -hmm. Or 20 year olds didn't have any sexual desire. There'd never be anything propelling us to say, hey, I want to seek a relationship. And you think about the covenant, the, the relationship of marriage, it's such a difficult relationship. There, there has to be something positive drawing us to want to share our lives with someone. And really, sexual desire is that powerful drive that says, I don't want to do life alone. I want to share my life with somebody, my body with somebody. I want to be known intimately by someone. And so I think when we talk about sexuality, not only to kids, but also to adults, we have to say that sexual desire is a God-given thing. It's a good thing that has been twisted in many ways. And we all need to have that redeemed. We need to know the truth about our sexuality so that we don't carry it around so much shame and guilt and baggage, but can really understand it as a good gift. So someone does have a lot of shame and guilt. What are some of the ways they can just begin to kind of heal that brokenness? Yeah, I think a big way is to begin talking about it. And you know, that's a big thing that we do in our ministry is just give people the avenue to talk about and to learn about healthy sexuality. You think about shame, shame grows in hiding, it grows in secrets. And I think a lot of people that have experienced uh, different aspects of sexual brokenness feel like this is a compartment of my life that I have to keep separated from the whole rest of me. Nobody can know about this. I don't want to think about it, but it impedes on you. It just, you always feel that cloud of shame. And so part of healing is saying, you know, I want to open up this box and talk about it. I want to pray about it and realize that God knows everything about me, even this little part that I don't want him to know. He knows, mm -hmm. and he doesn't know to condemn us. He knows because he desires to heal us. And so finding safe healing communities, uh, whether it be a, a caring counselor or whether it be just a group of people that you trust in your community or your church, uh, talking to family members that may be safe for you to just say, hey, I need to share something that I've been carrying for a while and talking to God about it and you know, just letting him know, hey, I'm carrying this, Lord, would you just take this burden off of me? Those are all aspects of finding freedom from the shame 
again, that is accentuated through secrets. Awesome. Okay, so how would you describe um, just our own state and our culture mm -hmm. um, about sexuality? Whew. Really confused and really twisted. Um, and this is where we kind of get into, we're going we're gonna to have disagreement. But basically, I think that our view of sexuality comes from our larger view about what's true. And uh, for somebody that comes from a faith perspective, you know, I believe in God and I believe that he created us with a design. And part of his creation was making us as sexual people, making us male, making us female, creating us with a sexual drive that would uh, consummate in family and, and be reproductive. That's God's design when we look at history, when we look at our biology, and certainly when we look at the Bible. Um, but we live in a culture today that is walking away from that belief that we have a creator who designed us with a purpose. And the majority of people in our culture today believe that we create our own purpose and that we create our own values of what's right and wrong. Mm -hmm. And so sexuality takes on this huge burden that it was never meant to carry of to be a fully actualized person, I have to discover who I am sexually, I have to have the freedom to act that out, or I can't find happiness. And so we have a very different way today, not only of looking at sexuality, but as looking at fulfillment, identity, uh, I need to be free from constraint. And so I think because of that, uh, sexuality, as I said, is, is holding a lot of weight that it was never meant to hold in our lives. We put so much stock on romance and being fulfilled and being sexually self-actualized, mm -hmm. uh, that there's a lot of misery around sexuality. I, I really believe it's one of the main pain points, particularly for women. Uh, when I talk to women, I hardly ever meet a woman who won't say, one of the greatest area of pain in my life relates to my sexuality. Mm. Uh, and, so, uh, and so my heart just really is burdened for that level of pain that the average woman is carrying. And, um, and I think a lot of it, again, goes back to we don't know how to think about it and put it in its right place. And if you are just tuning in, we are here with Dr. Julie Slattery, and she's talking about her book, Rethinking Sexuality. Um, and we are going to get back to asking her more questions about um, sexuality and how it pertains to our society. So, It says that um, the danger of an educational model is that it reduces complex issues to a five-week course. Explain that to me. Yeah, um, so a lot of what I talk about in Rethinking Sexuality is the difference between an educational model of sex and a discipleship model of sex. Uh, or you could even say a silence model of sex, which a lot of us grew up with, particularly in family or in faith communities. You just didn't talk about it. Mm -hmm. You were left to figure it out to yourself. But I think in today's culture, uh, we talk about sex education. Again, whether it be in the school or in the church or in the family, we have to have the talk with our teenager. Uh, we need to have the youth group go through this curriculum. And education is a really good thing, but education teaches you what to think about a particular topic, like sex, what to think about premarital sex, or what to think about is it okay to live together or not, or what to think about being male or female. A discipleship model goes beneath that and actually engages with you, not on what to think, but how to think. And I kind of alluded to this a few minutes ago that your worldview about why we're here as people and what is happiness and what is wholeness and what is brokenness, those are the foundations of how you think about your sexuality. And so I really think it's important to engage on issues, not at the level of, say, do you believe gay marriage is right or wrong, or all the arguments we have, mm -hmm. but to go below that in getting to know each other's people, mm -hmm. but also understanding the worldview that we're operating from and have discussions at that worldview level that are ultimately going to decide what we believe about the kinds of things that we tend to talk about. Awesome. Um, you know, I agree that it's based off of the teacher. Whoever's teaching you, this is what they believe, so yeah. that's what they just teach right. you to think is right. Yeah. I guess I never really thought about it that way yeah. um, when you look at those type of models, you know. Yes. So I, I like the discipleship. Um, 
Now, you did mention um, the pornography uh, atmosphere that we have, but how does the pornography and the hookup culture vandalize it? Well, sexuality was meant to um, be connected to who we are as spiritual and relational people. And so uh, when we think about sexuality as it was presented by our designer, by God, when we look at scripture, uh, if you, woke, if you, if you um, wrote, were raised in a church, you probably heard sex is for marriage. Did uh -huh. you hear that? And uh -huh. you're like, why is sex for marriage? Isn't it just for love? And so you got to think about the reason that it talks about sex being for marriage is because marriage is the ultimate giving of myself to another person. When I gave myself to my husband in marriage, I essentially said, your life will be joined with mine. And our journey together will now be trying to figure out how to become one with our finances, with our family, with our decisions. And so God gives the gift of sexual intimacy to symbolize that. It's like the physical party that happens that represents what I'm doing with my whole life. I'm giving myself to my husband. He's giving himself to me with our lives together. And so sex becomes a sacrament. It becomes something we do with our bodies to symbolize that. And what happens with pornography or the hookup culture is we want the symbol for one life together. We want the flesh together, but we're not doing the rest of it. We're not connecting relationally. We're not committing. We're not bringing God into that who created sex in the first place. And so it becomes this divided off, split off aspect of our humanity where I can have a sexual response with somebody that I literally have no relationship with. I don't care about. That person doesn't care about me. I never met them in the case of pornography. God goes out of the room. It seems like I don't want him involved in this. And so we become very divided people instead of being healthy people where we're integrated people. Uh, and I think when we even look at the psychological research, we see the more we engage in that kind of divided or splintered off sexual experience, uh, the more it impacts even our emotional health in terms of rates of, of depression, suicidal ideation, low self-esteem, anxiety, uh, because we weren't designed to experience sex attached or detached from what it was meant to express. Mm -hmm. Now you said, um Oh, I had a good question to go with that one. Um, so it says, why do we think, why do you think that we are more intentional about restoring our physical health than we are about our emotional and sexual health? And just kind of touching on what you just said about our, our health that we don't necessarily focus on. Yeah, I, even as we're recording this interview, obviously we're, we're in the middle of pa the pandemic and everybody's nervous and afraid about our physical health. And so we do all kinds of things that are inconvenient to protect ourselves. We came in with masks and we can't give each other a hug or right. we have to be distant um, because we're aware of physical dangers and we have hospitals set up to restore life. I don't think it's quite that way with our emotional and relational health. Uh, you just look at pornography. Um, again, if you look at the research and you see the level of sexual addiction and sexual dysfunction that is happening just as a result of pornography in our culture, you would say emotionally and spiritually and relationally, it's as damaging and deadly as like COVID would be to our physical health. Uh, it's, it's killing relationships. It's sabotaging people as they try to understand intimacy. But are we taking the same kinds of precautions to get healing and to make people aware of a danger as we are with COVID? Well, absolutely not. There are lots of places that are celebrating things like pornography. It's a multi, multi-billion dollar industry. Okay. Um, and so that's just one example of how we kind of say, well, it's just kind of a normal part of our culture and we don't take it as the kind of threat that it really is. And that's just, again, one example. If we look at more horrendous things, we look at sex trafficking. Yeah. Uh, we look at, uh, you know, just all kinds of paying for sex and the sexual abuse and molestation that's happening right here in our city and homes and in churches, unfortunately. You know, this is an insidious way that we're being damaged as people, um, but we don't want to think about it and we don't want to take it as seriously as it is. And I think that's true. Those are extreme examples. But even like brokenness in marriage, you know, I'll talk to couples who will say, 
we haven't had sex in 20 years, or uh, my husband had an affair and we've never worked through that. I've never forgiven him. So those are ways that are serious that we don't say, let's get some help. Mm -hmm. uh, we shouldn't be stuck in this state of relational sickness, so to speak. Um, and so, you know, I, I think of it in terms of if we took it as seriously as we did our physical health, we'd be approaching these issues much differently than we are today. Um, and you mentioned brokenness and shame. And what would you say to um, somebody who is married or, like you just said, mm -hmm. the woman who hasn't experienced anything with her husband? What would you say to them um, as a result of them right now just feeling so hopeless? Yeah, well, the first thing I would say is you're not alone. Um, you know, in my job, I meet women mostly, but sometimes married couples a lot uh, all over the country. We get emails from all over the world. And uh, I can't tell you, the, unfortunately, the level of brokenness that's just normal in our day and age. So you're not alone if that's you. And second of all, I would tell you, we're here to help. You know, we are a, an international ministry, digital online, that has all kinds of resources um, for women and couples that are experiencing whatever, whether it's uh, I'm trying to recover from a trauma from my past, or my spouse and I are trying to recover from an infidelity, mm -hmm. uh, or I've never enjoyed sex. It's always been physically painful for me. Uh, we want to get you the resources or point you to a place where you can get help for that uh, and not stay stuck. You know, I even just think about, you know, allergies in our culture. And if you have allergies, you'll do anything to get rid of those allergies. Guess and allergies will. is just an <laughs> annoying thing, right? And think about some of the allergies we have related to relationships and sexuality that we just put up with. And yeah. we just assume this is always going to be here. There's no help. I would say be tenacious about seeking help. If you talk to somebody and they don't help you, then go find somebody else. Yeah. Um, because that's what we do with our physical health. That's awesome. I love that analogy. You do what you have to do to get rid of your allergies. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Anything that's not beneficial for you. Okay. Um, so you recently had your digital summit, Reclaim 2.0, God's Design for Sexuality and Why It Matters. Can you tell me about about it and what you hope people left feeling. Yeah, uh, it was just really exciting. I mean, I don't like to do digital events. I love to do events in person so I could see people. And so when we first were like, okay, we're doing a, a digital event, I was like, oh, bummer. But it turned out in many ways to be great because we had over 4,000 people sign up for it, which never would have happened in person yeah. from like, probably 30, 40 different countries from around the world. Really? And we are also able to have interviews and panels with experts from all over the country, which we, again, we couldn't have afforded to do in person. Mm -hmm. But what I really hope people got from it is, first of all, I said it before, but you're not alone. These issues, we don't talk about them, so you feel very isolated. Uh, but there are other people who are dealing with very similar things. And there are also other people who have overcome very similar things. Uh, and the most important thing is not just to hear that you're not alone because other people can relate, but you're not alone because God cares. He sees you. We apply this to so many areas of our life. Uh, right now I have a friend in the hospital and I'm praying for my friend and I know that God is with him in the hospital. Why do we not apply this to our sexual brokenness? I have a friend who's walking through healing from very serious sexual abuse. God is with her. God is, God is near to her. And knowing the presence of God, that again, Jesus said, I didn't come into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world. And so many times when we think about our sexuality and we think about God, we think about a condemning God rather than a God who says, I want to heal you. I want to restore you. I want to redeem you. And that's really my heart. You know, I'm trained as a clinical psychologist and psychology can help, but it can't heal. Mm -hmm. Only the healer can heal. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I want people to know is that, uh, that they have a God who created them and who is the redeemer and the healer. And he sees your pain and he cares about you. Um, and then just as a final wrap up, what are um, your favorite resources or anything that's coming up and how people can contact you. 
Yeah. Um, when you say my favorite resources, I never like to talk about my <laughs> resources. Um, but I, I would encourage you to go to our website, okay. AuthenticIntimacy.com, because okay. we just have a lot of things for you to plug into there. We have small groups that meet online and go through different studies. Mm -hmm. And we have a, a podcast every week called Java with Julie, where we just talk about some of these issues very specifically. And, mm -hmm. uh, and again, from a discipleship model, mm -hmm. uh, books, Bible studies. And so that would be kind of the hub of where you can find what we're doing as a ministry and also pointing you to other organizations that can be helpful. Awesome. AuthenticIntimacy.com. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> thank you all for joining us today. And thank you so much for sharing some wisdom and some nuggets. And you guys, please be sure to get her book. It's great. And thank you for tuning in to Forum 360, where we have a global outlook from a local view. Have a great week. Forum 360 is brought to you by John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, the Akron Community Foundation, Hudson Community Television, the Rubber City Radio Group, Shaw Jewish Community Center of Akron, Blue Green, Electric Impulse Communications, and Forum 360 supporters.